In this video, we will discuss the basic ingredients of the DP3T protocol for decentralized privacy preserving proximity tracing. As its name uh, suggested, DP3T has no central authority except for a server that is essentially a shared memory for all users. This means that it's essentially all up to the users to make proximity tracing work. To do so, a user, uh, let's call her Alice, will first have to create an identity by generating a random secret key. If Alice generated her secret key on day T, this secret key will be denoted SK of T. Unless Alice is later tested positive to COVID-19 and wants to reveal SKT to alert other users that they may be at risk, the secret key SKT will remain secret. And even in the case where SKT is revealed, Alice's identity will not be revealed. Only her secret key will be revealed. This is what protects the privacy of Alice, though there are caveats to this that we will discuss in a future video. Now, on day T, Alice will derive 288 ephemeral identifiers from her secret key SKT using a pseudo-random generator G that uses SKT as its seed. In other words, an eavesdropper, let's call her Eve, that hears one ephemeral identifier but does not know the secret key SKT would be clueless about what the other ephemeral identifiers may be. But given SKT, it is straightforward to compute the ephemeral identifiers as they equal G of SKT. The precise value of G and the size of the ephemeral identifiers are provided in DP3T's white paper but I won't dwell too much on these details in this video. Then, Alice will randomly shuffle the 288 ephemeral identifiers on day T and put them in a random order. Every five minutes, she will pick the next ephemeral identifier of the list and will be broadcasting it via Bluetooth. Thus, any listening Bluetooth device will be hearing Alice's phone repeating over and over the same ephemeral identifier for 5 minutes. And then, after 5 minutes, another ephemeral identifier will be chosen and broadcast. Note that because of the pseudo-random generation of identifiers, unless Eve knows Alice's secret key SKT, she will be unable to know that Alice's different ephemeral identifiers correspond to the same secret key SKT, as all ephemeral identifiers will appear random to Eve. In addition to broadcasting, Alice will also be listening to other phones' ephemeral identifiers. This allows Alice to compile a list of ephemeral identifiers she has been in proximity with. For each contact with an ephemeral identifier, Alice will also note the duration of the contact as well as an estimation of the distance of contact based on the strength of the Bluetooth signal. Finally, she will note a rough estimate of the time of contact, like say May 11 in the morning. The next day, T plus 1, Alice will compute a new secret key SK T plus 1 using a public cryptographic hash function H. She will define SK of T plus 1 equals to H of SKT. The fact that the hash function is public allows any other user who knows SKT to compute Alice's secret key after day T. But it will prevent Eve from computing secret keys before day T. This is because the hash function H is a one-way function. It is easy to compute in one direction from SKT to SKT plus 1, but it is hard to compute in the opposite direction from SKT plus 1 to SKT. Now, assume that Alice finds out that she is COVID positive on day T. Then, in collaboration with health agencies that tested her, Alice will estimate the first day on which she was contagious. Then, to alert other users of COVID risk so that they too get tested and can isolate themselves, with the authorization of the health agencies that will typically come in the form of a one-time password delivered at the same time as the test result, Alice can share publicly her secret key SKT. In practice, to do so, Alice will publish her secret key SKT on the server. This means that the server will then host a list of secret keys SKT of users who became contagious on day T. Every now and then, other DP3T users, like Bob, will then download the list of secret keys published on the server. Using this list, Bob can now check 
if he has been in contact with contagious DP3T users. Indeed, given a published secret key SKT, Bob can compute all posterior secret keys SKT plus 1, SKT plus 2, and so on until SK capital T. And then he can compute all ephemeral identifiers associated to these secret keys. This yields a list of contagious ephemeral identifiers. Bob can then compare the list of contagious ephemeral identifiers with the list of ephemeral identifiers he entered in contact with. The intersection of the two lists then yields the set of contagious ephemeral identifiers Bob was exposed to. If such contacts are too numerous, lasted too long and were in too close proximity, then Bob may be at risk. Bob will then receive an alert automatically triggered by his phone that says so. He will then be invited to take a COVID-19 test and to isolate himself. Let me add that this is the basic version of DP3T. An upgrade has been provided that provides better privacy guarantees by exploiting the idea of cuckoo filters. And overall, this is it. This is how DP3T works. Its strength relies on the fact that this system is essentially fully decentralized and that all public information, like secret keys and ephemeral identifiers, looks like random noise to an eavesdropper. Well, this holds as long as the eavesdropper cannot match secret keys to actual identities or ephemeral identifiers to other ephemeral identifiers. Now, unfortunately, this will not always be the case. Some eavesdropper may exploit information outside of DP3T to leverage the information communicated by DP3T to learn about the COVID-19 status of some DP3T users. This is something that we will be discussing in a future video. So, technically, it is inadequate to consider that DP3T is fully privacy-preserving. Nevertheless, DP3T is arguably very privacy-preserving in the sense that a Neves dropper will have to deploy costly measures to learn what is arguably limited information, especially if you compare this to the privacy breaches of essentially all the other applications of our smartphones. While DP3T is not perfect, as long as your phone runs iOS or Android, DP3T seems arguably vastly more privacy preserving than essentially any other application on your smartphone, especially if you use Facebook, Netflix or Tinder.